I'd like to call our uh, meeting to order here. Um, I'd like everybody to sign the sign-in sheet uh, because of uh, some of the grants that we have applied for and gotten and some of them that we will apply for in the future are going to need to know the interest. Um, so if everybody could sign that uh, sign-in sheet as it goes around, I'd appreciate it. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking Paul O'Brien and the select board of Wolfboro and the town of Wolfboro for handling and, and uh, hosting uh, this meeting for us. Beautiful hall. Yes. <laughs> I'm envious. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, I'd like to start off here uh, and just wel welcome uh, two new committee representatives. Um, we have a representative, uh, Sean uh, Set. Is Sean here? Yes. Right there. Ah. He's representing both Bartlett and Jackson. Yes. Um, and um, Micah Voter, who is one of the selectmen in Chatham, uh, just took a new job. Um, and they have appointed Bert Weiss. Right there. To be their representative. And, and Micah will, I believe, continue on as the alternate and wants to be kept in the loop and, and on the email list. With, that's right, you weren't at the last meeting. Our, our representatives from Ossipi, and I don't know who's the alternate and who's the uh, rep, but Joy Gagnon is representing Ossipi. Thank you. Um, and we'll get into the regular business of the meeting after our guest uh, speaker from Consolidated um, gives his presentation, discussion, and questions and answers. Similar to what we did at the last meeting in Moultonboro uh, with GWI. And I'd like to introduce Rob Custer. He's the Vice President of Consumer Products from uh, Consolidated Communications. Steve and I have met with him uh, back Oh, a month or so ago. Um, we've had many phone conversations. Uh, they're very interested in, in working with us, and consequently, we've invited him to come here and speak to the committee uh, about what they can offer us as a partner, possibly down the road. So without any further discussion, I will turn it over to Rob. Rick, thank you very much. Um, my name is Rob Custer with Consolidated Communications. And so this morning I have a couple of folks with me that I want to introduce. We're also going to hand out some materials. I um, elected not to do PowerPoint karaoke for you this morning. Um, and I wanted to give you guys some things to take home with you that maybe have some good and relevant information for you. So I wanted to in introduce my folks as they hand out the materials. Um, Jeff Nevins is, uh, is in our group, spends a lot of time working with towns. The fiber overbuilds that we're doing in the southern part of the state, Jeff's responsible for project managing all those. Um, we have Ellen Scarponi, which many of you probably know. Um, Ellen works in our governmental relations group and spent a lot of time in New Hampshire. And we also have Jeff Nevins. Um, Jeff is also in our governmental relations group, uh, primarily based in Maine, but he does a lot of work in New Hampshire as well. You can imagine the number of towns that we're talking to right now. We've got to spread the wealth out a little bit. Um, a lot of select board meetings on the same night, so appreciate that. What I want to go through today is we hand out the materials. Is everybody getting a copy? Thank you very much. Um, so I want to go through really four basic things today and, and really want to keep this informal. So as you have questions, as things pop up, please don't hesitate. Also, I would encourage you to maybe read ahead in the materials. If you see something that spawns a question, um, you know, just shout out and we'll handle those anytime. Rob? Yes. Just one interruption here. Mm -hmm. If anybody is going to speak or ask a question, I have been asked to have everybody speak into a microphone okay. because it, it's actually being recorded so that we can share this meeting with uh, the public and, and folks that are on the committee that were unable to attend. So if, if you're going to speak to anything or ask a question, try to get to a microphone to do it. Thank Great. you. Thank you. So I want to go through four basic things today. I want to do a, a quick um, a corporate overview. It's going to be less commercial and more a little bit about us. Um, consolidated Communications acquired the assets of the Fairpoint uh, organization about two and a half years ago. So I want to talk a little bit about who we are, what we do. I promise to minimize the commercial there. I want to talk about a few key activities and the, and the, the core things that we focused on. 
as we integrated the Fairpoint properties or the former Fairpoint properties. I want to do a little bit of a network review, talk about what we have in New Hampshire in general, and then Carroll County in particular. And I also want to walk you through a small case study. Um, and I'll tell you now, this is kind of the bumper sticker. I say this pretty frequently, rural broadband is what we do. Um, you'll hear me reference you know, the former Fairpoint organization, won't disparage the business model. It was a different plan. Uh, Fairpoint was primarily focused on the large enterprise space, the governments, um, and less focused on consumer and small business. Uh, if, you, if you flip the slide, what you're going to see is a little bit about CCI. We have about 4,000 employees. We do serve 23 states. I'm going to show you a map here in just a second, but it's important to note that on those 23 states, we don't serve what we call NFL cities. Um, we do serve some larger communities, but we serve the suburban areas. We don't serve the urban cores. The vast majority of the 2.6 million passings that we have in those 23 states are rural in nature. Um, they don't all have mountains um, as, as beautiful as we have here in the North Country or the lakes that we have in the North Country. Some are in South Texas. Um, some are in the middle of nowhere in, in Kansas. Some in California, some in Missouri, or I'm sorry, yeah, Missouri, um, and states across the country. But the vast majority of what we do is rural broadband. So this is stuff that, that we've been doing for decades. Um, we, one of our core corporate values is also giving back. So we do spend a lot of time in the community. We're invested in these communities. We're here to stay. Uh, we didn't take the Fairpoint properties on to, to flip in a few years. Uh, we're committed. We're here. We're local. If you flip the slide uh, to the next page, you do see that service territory. You know, the nice thing about consolidated, I'm going to give you a little bit of the commercial, is we're the ninth largest fiber provider in the country. We have about 37,000 route miles of fiber um, across the entire country. The gap between us and number eight is pretty large. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty big gulf. So we are large enough to be able to bring the high-tech products and services to market, to bring all of the newest technology, but small enough to still be invested and involved in the local communities. Um, in the upper right-hand corner of that, uh, the map of the U.S., you see that big cluster, that's our northern New England properties. From a contiguous market basis, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont is by far the largest contiguous um, set of properties that we have. When we did the Fairpoint acquisition, we essentially doubled the size of the company, but it's something that we've been doing for a number of years. We've actually grown through acquisition. We were a family-owned company for 97 years. Um, our chairman and CEO was the founder's great-grandson, or grandson, actually. Um, went public in 2004 and have been publicly traded. Still a fair majority of our stock um, is still owned by the, the family, but we are a publicly traded company. This map gives you just a little bit of a, a flavor of where we serve and what we do. Again, the majority of these are not NFL urban core areas. The majority of these passings are rural subscribers. And broadband is the key. Real quickly, just kind of a business overview. I'm going to flip the next three uh, pages fairly quickly. We, we break our business up into three lines of business, what we call carrier wholesale, commercial, and consumer. Um, our carrier wholesale service really focuses on other carriers. Uh, we have about 4,000 cell towers that we serve across the country. About half of those are here in northern New England. Um, we work with all the major, uh, all the major carriers. Uh, the carrier team also works with large universities, very, very large multi-state uh, multi and international enterprise, um, what we call hyperscalers. So if you think of the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, when they build data centers in our service territory, they come to us for transport and connectivity to those places. Our enterprise space focuses primarily on um, small, medium-sized business on up to large enterprise. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about a little bit about our focus and what we uh, what we wanted to achieve when we acquired the Fairpoint markets. One of those is bringing new products and services to bear. Um, the Fairpoint organization done a pretty good job in the enterprise space, but in the last 24 months, I think we've launched something on the order of 20 or 30 new enterprise products, really bringing the enterprise space in Northern New England up to, to world-class service. Things like SD-WAN, um, a whole suite of cloud offerings. So cloud is a big deal, um, you know, cloud security, um, protecting from things like distributed denial of service attacks. That's where the, the business and carrier commercial team is mainly focused. Um, the residential services, that's what I do. Um, I am responsible for the residential services and small business services across our 23 state footprint. 
uh, was originally in East Central Illinois um, when, when I started with the company, moved to Texas when we did the acquisition of, the, of uh, Texas markets in 2004, and then moved up here and lived just outside of Manchester about two and a half years ago. And that's part of the local feel. Uh, we moved a number of folks from other markets, other states, into northern New England, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont um, to, to help move that culture along a little bit faster. So residential services is traditional voice service, it's voice over IP, um, it's television service, it is um, data service, and, and pretty much everything in between. So if you look at any of our public filings or you listen to our earnings calls, uh, you'll hear continual references to the three C's, consumer, commercial, and carrier. Those are the three lines of business. My responsibility is P&L responsibility and business development responsibility for the consumer, uh, the consumer um, platform. So in 2007, when we acquired the properties from Fairpoint, we really were after two things. Um, the first being the people. There's a, a very deep depth of knowledge in the employees in the Fairpoint markets. And that integration has really helped us as an organization. Um, new ways of thinking, new ways of doing business. The second thing that we looked for, and this is really what the investment bankers looked for, was the network. What we saw in northern New England was an incredibly robust fiber network. We have 37,000 route miles of fiber. 22,000 of those miles are in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Um, again, we talked about the Fairpoint business model really focused on the enterprise space and above, not as much on the, the consumer and small business space. Our job, we saw it very, very clearly, was building those last mile connections. The core network is there. It's incredibly robust. There's a lot of fiber out there. What hadn't been done, though, we're making those middle mile and last mile connections to the end users. So we really developed three primary integration priorities as we took on the assets in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. First and foremost was shoring up service reliability and on-time performance. Um, and there's a lot of things that go into that. Pretty experienced teams. Um, you know, we've been there and done that on service <laughs> delivery before. We spent the last two and a half years uh, doing two things. One, increasing staffing in areas where we were dramatically understaffed before. Field service, um, our central office operations, so our ability to get equipment installed faster, and our customer service and care teams. So um, the, the second piece of that is process. How do we do business? How do we make sure that when we say we're going to be at your house at 11 o'clock on Friday morning, we're at your house at 11 o'clock on Friday morning? I can tell you with total transparency that, that less than probably a year and a half ago, um, if we told you we were going to be at your house at a specific time, we were only making that about 40% of the time. We've completely blown up our installation process. We've uh, added staffing where it needed to be added. Today, we're hitting about 92% on-time arrival. About 6% of that remaining gap is customer wasn't there when we knocked on the door. So we're making progress, but it's a big ship. And for us, customer experience, service delivery never stops. We always continue to refine. We always continue to try to improve. Um, but we are very, very cognizant of you know, frankly, the brand hangover and the poor customer experience the customers in Northern New England have had for years and are working really hard to change that. I think we've made quite a bit of progress, but there's still quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of work left to do. Our second priority was growing overall network speeds. Uh, if you, again, follow any of our public information, uh, day one in the consumer segment going back for 10 or 15 years, you're going to hear we lead with speed, we lead with speed, we lead with speed. Uh, for us, key to profitability in the end user and being successful in the markets isn't traditional access line, although we do that and do it fairly well. Um, it's a core, core component of what we do. Broadband is the key for subscribers. Um, so one of our first priorities was, and you can talk about it in complex language and complex terms, but at the end of the day is we needed to make it go faster. The network that we picked up two and a half years ago was not at the latest technology because, again, was not Fairpoint's business plan. Uh, it was technology, the technology in the market at that time was technology that had been around for 10 or more years. Uh, so one of our first priorities was we need to make it go faster. And through 2018 into the beginning of 2019, we're still, still ongoing now, we endeavored to make it go faster. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the details there in a minute. And then finally, and I referenced this earlier, bringing new products and service to market. Um, in the commercial sense, we've brought a ton of new 
uh, cloud-based products and services to market. Those are continuing. You're going to continue to see new enterprise services being delivered. Not only new enterprise services, but replacing things that we serve today that we can do better. Um, our voice over IP commercial products, as, as an example, we have a new platform coming at the first part of next year. It's the next generation um, cutting edge platform. In the consumer space, it was things like uh, voice over IP technology. We recognize that uh, you know, our hands are a little bit tied when it comes to pricing on things like traditional access line that's regulated by the state. Um, it doesn't give us a lot of pricing flexibility, so we launched a voice over IP product. Um, a lot less cost, more feature functionality, but you lose the ability to get PowerFail 911. So there's a, there's a trade-off. We're trying to give customers pricing options and feature options as well. Um, here, just in the last two or three months, we've launched a new TV product throughout northern New England. Um, it is fully available in this area right now. Um, full channel lineup, 222 channels, something like that. Um, including uh, Nesson, so we, we will carry Red Sox games and, and Bruins games. That's a, that's a must-have. So it's not just making it go faster. It's not just improving the service reliability and our on-time uh, on time performance, but it's also driving new products and services being innovative in the marketplace. So those are our three integration priorities. And again, those never stop. We call them integration priorities. We will continue to do those things um, to improve service experience. So I'll drill down a little bit into our network in New Hampshire specifically. Um, of the 37,000 route miles, about 7,000 of those miles are in New Hampshire specifically. In New Hampshire, we have a little over 500,000 what we call passings. Um, a passing is a business or a resident, uh, a residence. Now, we're going to get into Carroll County here in just a minute. I'm going to give you some detail on that. We count passings a little bit differently than probably your tax folks do. As a general rule, we typically show more than you do. A couple reasons for that. One is, if there's a vacant lot, we probably count that, because there may be somebody building there someday. If there's an apartment complex or an MDU that has 10 uh, units, we count those as 10 separate locations. Towns and cities may not. So round numbers, we have uh, about 524,000 total passings in New Hampshire. Uh, and this is the technology that I talked about. When, when we took the network over two and a half years ago, it was primarily ADSL2 plus bonding. That's a technology that's used to deliver about 25 meg over copper to a specific distance. Um, very early on, we moved uh, to new technology and started equipping all of our, uh, all of our capable equipment and central offices which, with uh, technology called VDSL. VDSL will allow you to get 80 to 100 meg. So in most of 2018, we really boosted speeds quite a bit in northern New Hampshire, not for everybody. 500,000 passings, um, about 34% of those were, uh, uh, we, we increased speeds in northern New England to over 500,000 passings, about 34% of those were in, uh, in New Hampshire. What we generally saw is customers that were getting 7 meg could now get 20 meg. Customers that are getting 20 meg could now get um, 60 meg or 80 meg or 100 meg. So it was a it was a transformational shift in uh, in speed. And I got to tell you, um, we talked about some of the back office issues we've been working to resolve. We threw we threw gas on that fire. Um, we opened up much much faster speed availability, and it really very quickly highlighted um, deficiencies in the back office that we had inherited that were pretty bad. So we spent, um, we actually stopped marketing in the middle of 2018 in order to fix our back office and be able to scale. And in what, March of this year, we actually started marketing again. So we, we took ourselves out of the game um, voluntarily for about six months or eight months in order to fix the issues that we have. We're scalable now, we're not perfect, we're still gonna miss some appointments. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but we always um, fire on those things and try to clean up customer process and experience as much as possible. But I can tell you we're much, much more scalable now than we were um, just even a year and a half ago. And here's a great example of that. Um, I love to talk about this. We, we measure um, not only for the FCC but for the PU and the PUCs, but for our, in, our own internal um, measuring sticks, how quickly we recover from major events. Windstorms are one of the biggest things for us. We don't like ice storms, no ice storms this year, knock on wood. Um, but windstorms are things that are fairly common. Uh, two years ago, right before Halloween, there was a windstorm that came through. It was a pretty bad one. Um, it took us about eight weeks to fully recover from that windstorm. 
And what that means is we're out putting up new lines, we're out trimming tree and getting trees that haven't been trimmed out of the way, we're, we're reconstructing network, putting up new poles. When we're doing that, it means that new service orders are delayed. It means the trouble is delayed. Um, we had a windstorm, uh, another, Halloween and windstorms don't seem, uh, Halloween you should, should uh, um, expect a windstorm based on the past couple of years. We had another windstorm right before Halloween this year, it may have been on Halloween. Um, similar size, similar scale, we were fully recovered in four days because we were able to bring in additional resources. We actually gotten to a point where if you look at the service map, we have property in New York, we have property in Pennsylvania, we've got near, near net properties where we'll be able to, we're able now to bring in technicians pretty quickly from other areas and dramatically improve our restoral time. So we talked about making it go faster. VDSL was a big deal, um, made it go faster. In New Hampshire today, I have about 100,000 fiber passings. Total company, I have somewhere around 500,000. About 20% of those are in New Hampshire. The uh, max capable speed on those fiber passings was 150 meg, which just boggles my mind. Why would you put fiber in and limit it to 150 meg? Um, about three or four months ago, we took all of those customers with the capability of up to one gig. And everything that we do going forward on fiber is, uh, is one gig capable, symmetrical. So we talked about the upgrades. Um, we upgraded in New Hampshire about 100, uh, I'm sorry, 247,000 passings. Um, about 147,000 of those were copper and about 100,000 of those were fiber. And that's a uh, continual effort. We've kind of done the first pass in the VDSL technology. Now we're going in and finding specific areas and it really is working with towns. Um, that's the best effort for us. It's the best way to get these done. Find specific areas that are pain points um, and getting feedback from all of you. So if you have areas that you know that are painful for you, specific areas in your town where, hey, there's a, there's a pocket we should go hit. Let me, me or the team know where those things are. We'll look at them and see what we can do to get, uh, get those resolved. Because we continually invest in the network. Our capital budget every year is about $200 million. About 65% of that is what we call success-based capital. Uh, so the remainder is things we have to do just to maintain network operations. The rest of it, uh, the rest of it, 65% is really, hey, we see an area of opportunity here. Let's go build something right there and, and satisfy those customers. Then in regards to Carroll County in particular, um, there's about 300, uh, about 300 miles of fiber in Carroll County right now. Um, and given the population and the size, that's actually a, quite a bit of fiber. And one of the things that attracted us to the Fairpoint properties, there is an incredible amount of backbone fiber out there, but it's not being utilized to hit those middle mile and last mile. And that's the key, is building that middle mile and last mile where we possibly can. There are about 24 central offices. That's a little bit of... Uh, I hate putting that number on there because we have equipment all over the place. Um, we have about 24 physical buildings that we serve out of. We have hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of remote equipment that sits out and is powered in the middle of nowhere sitting on a telephone pole. You drive down the road and you see a box that looks about like a dorm fridge mounted to a telephone pole. It's probably one of ours. Carroll County in general has about 47,000 passings, give or take. Now, it's important to note that, as you probably all know, a fair percentage of those are seasonal. Um, by our count, 40 or 50 percent of those are seasonal. We view those slightly different. We count them as passings, but typically if you look at a resort complex as an example, we count those individual condos, um, but those typically don't get end user retail residential services. Typically in those cases, we work with the property owner or the developer and say, okay, what's the solution for them in total? Um, so 40, roughly 47,000 passings, call it 40 or 50% of those uh, are probably seasonal in one form or another. If you add your numbers up, you probably should get fairly close to that. My guess is, again, we're going to be a little bit higher than you will if you add up all of your tax rolls, uh, primarily because we count uh, MDUs as multiple and we count um, empty lots as a general rule. The average subscribed speed in Car Carroll County on our network today is about 16 meg. Uh, two years ago, it was about 9 meg. So we talked about those speed increases that we've done, tremendous uh, uptake on those, and we've seen, uh, we've seen speeds drive up because of that. And one key point um, that, that I, I always try to make to folks, 31% of the folks in Carroll County right now are subscribed to their maximum speed, which means there's a ton of people that could get faster speed and don't. A lot of reasons for that. Um, some could be they don't know it's available, which just drives me crazy knowing how much money we spend on marketing every year. Um, drives me nutty. Um, it could be, I don't need it to go any faster. I'm fine where I'm at. But it's an important point to note 
that especially, you know, we talk to a lot of towns, and they're like, hey, everybody's gonna buy one gig over fiber. Well, no, they're not. They're probably not. Generally, we see about 4% of subscribers take one gig. We see a lot of customers take 50 and 100 meg. So expectations of we put a fiber network out and everybody's gonna subscribe to the maximum speed, probably not super accurate. We will see customers go up, absolutely no doubt about that. And it's important to have one gig symmetrical, in my opinion. Um, five years ago, we had identified about two or three use cases. We started deploying uh, one gig over fiber about five years ago. So five years ago, it was, what's anybody ever gonna use one gig for? We identified about two or three non-commercial, commercial, um, being a, you know, a large business or enterprise, use cases where a customer would actually use one gig. And they're things like a doctor who works from home viewing radi uh, radiographs uh, from, from home. So hospital calls and says, hey, I need you to view a radiograph. Instead of driving into the hospital, they email him a radiograph that's seven or 800 meg. Um, he can get those, view them, manipulate them, do whatever he needs to do. Um, architects and photographers are also two big ones, um, moving large files back and forth. We've now identified somewhere in the neighborhood of nine or 10 legitimate use cases where somebody could use one gig over fiber. That's gonna to continue to grow. Uh, with things like VR and um, um, video conference and, and a whole host of other things, the home office is really growing. So one gig symmetrical is incredibly important and not just the speed, but also measures of things like latency and jitter. Um, how fast can you get that through? What kind of bandwidth sharing do you have on that network, if any? So as you look at moving forward, here's the one piece of advice I'd give you as a guy who's built networks for a while. Take my CCI hat off for a second. Um, look, at, look at the details of the network. Um, what's being delivered? Are you future-proofing yourself? What are the use cases people are gonna use this for and will it satisfy their needs? What does the core network look like? Does it have enough capacity to handle the traffic you're gonna put on these networks, because the last thing you wanna do is make an investment, um, a large investment of one form or another, and realize at the end of it, you know what, we didn't get exactly what we thought. With fiber, it's future-proof, in my opinion. So that's Carroll County. I wanna take just a, a brief minute and talk about a couple of things um, before I get into the, the quick case study. We've had an awful busy year over the last year putting new fiber networks out. Um, you know, we, we, two or three years ago, I would meet with towns and I would meet with large homeowners associations. And it was kind of frustrating, frankly, for everybody because they would be banging their fist on the table saying, we want faster speeds. We'd say, we, we want faster speeds too. Um, but you know, here's the economics. It's really difficult in some of these cases. And the, the game really changed for me um, last year when SB 170 became law and it became RSA 33 3G. Um, that was, was groundbreaking legislation. I'm not aware, other, other states have similar type legislation, but the, the community effort from the service provider community, from the towns and from the state legislature that put that legislation together was groundbreaking. Um, and, and I call it enabling legislation. It built the foundation. We've since then found a business model that takes that to the next step because RSA 333G essentially says you can bond for broadband, but it doesn't say how you pay it back. And initially, you know, some of the early discussions we had is, well, how do you pay it back? Do you raise taxes? That's always super popular. Or do you pay for it out of general funds? Not many towns have two or three or four or five million dollars sitting in general funds to do this. So working with Chesterfield, and I'm probably plowing ground that all of you know, but I wanna give you the quick recap to build to where we are today. Working with Chesterfield, um, we designed a business model that has no tax increase anywhere across the board. There's no taxpayer um, dollars out the door. Uh, we, we are charging an infrastructure fee for every single subscriber who gets on the new network and buys broadband. So in Chesterfield, we just completed our build actually, Chesterfield, voted um, last March. They received their funding in late June. We began, actually we started work before that, accumulating materials and all that. We built 92 miles of fiber in Chesterfield in about six weeks. Um, we completed, we have additional work to do splicing and all that stuff. We started turning the first customers up in Chesterfield, our test lines up in uh, late September. We turned the first customers up in the middle of October and we just finished that build actually this week. So the last customers now have availability. Chesterfield, in less than one year, went from 100% copper to 100% fiber capability. 
and there's no tax increase to the end user. The structure is anybody who buys broadband on the new network pays a $10 per month surcharge on their bill. We collect that $10 per month surcharge and use that as proceeds to pay the bond principal plus interest. If there's a shortfall, and we know for the first few years as we ramp that network up there will be a shortfall, we cover the shortfall. When we get to a point where we have enough customers on the network, the bond banks, unfortunately, at least in Chesterfield's model, won't let us prepay. I think everybody would like to see us just leave that at 10 bucks and prepay the bond in 15 or 16 years. Um, but from what we understand, the, the, the low interest rate that comes with these bonds, the bondholders want their full 20 years. So what we'll do is every two years work back with the select board. We'll say what's the bond principal plus interest because I'm learning a lot more about municipal bonds than I ever thought I would know. Um, the, the bond payment goes down every year. So if the subscriber base stays stable, we're going to over collect at some point, probably according to our model starting in year four, five, six, something like that. Every two years, we sit down with the select board. We, real simple math, what's the bond payment for the next two years? How many subscribers are on the network? Divide one into the other. You have a new infrastructure fee. So in Chesterfield, it's do not exceed $10. We expect every two or three years, that infrastructure fee is going to drop by 50 to 75 cents over the course of the bond. So it pays down along with the debt service. We've taken that same model. So that was last year's, uh, last year's vote cycle. This year, um, we've seen, I think, seven RFIs and seven RFPs. And the way the process works is towns issue a request for information. So they send a letter out to all the service providers in town saying, what do you have? Under non-disclosure, and we'll talk about that in a second, um, under an NDA, we then provide the town with, here's every address that we have in your town, and here's the maximum available speed we have. The towns then take all of those, combine them together, and they create a comprehensive town-wide broadband map. That is incredibly critical to know exactly where you're at because RSA 33.3G says that bond funds are only available to locations that are below a 25 meg down, 3 meg up standard, which is the current federal definition of broadband. It's one of the current de federal definitions of broadband. There's more than one. Um, so that allows the town then to issue an RFP that says, build me a network that gets to at least 25 by 3 for everybody in the town. Now, our approach to that is, as a general rule, we haven't seen one yet where the math hasn't worked, we build the entire town. And any place that's already at 25 by 3, we pass it with fiber anyway, we're going to go ahead and drop fiber in there. So that's where you get Chesterfield with, you know, a little over 2,000 total passings, um, about call it 12 or 13% of Chesterfield was above that 25 by 3 standard, we bear the cost of, that, uh, of those remaining locations. So in Chesterfield, the total network price was $2.1 million. The town bonds for 1.8, because that covers the, uh, the locations that are below 25 by 3. We cover the other 300,000. We also cover the cost of the drop from the pole to the end user, the electronics in the home, um, and then any CPE and labor associated with that. So the bill, the network build to get from the internet to the poles in Chesterfield is 2.1 million. The cost to get from the poles to the customer home and actually deliver internet access um, is, uh, is about another eight or 900,000, something in that neighborhood. We bear the cost of the, the incremental 300,000 for the build. We bear the cost for all of the drop in equipment. And in that case, in, in these cases, there's no, uh, there's no end user install fee. We just install the customers and move service along. We've been able to replicate this model of the, I think, seven RFPs that we've seen. Um, <clears throat> we actually have four other towns um, that we're moving down the road with right now and negotiating agreements with on what that looks like. Uh, we're changing up how we do this just a little bit based on some, we're still learning things uh, as we go along the way, uh, but we're, we're changing things up a little bit about network ownership, who owns what when. Um, if you would have asked me two years ago who owns the network, I would have said us. And there, it, it is an immovable object. We have to own the network. Well, I have done a complete 180 on that. In these models that we're talking about today, the towns own the network, and they own it forever. It's a town asset. We provide two things. One is we'll build and construct the network, and the second thing is we will operate the network beyond that. And we still pay every year for the privilege of operating the network in the town and, and receiving the revenue that we generate. Um, we pay the town an amount that is equal to the bond principal plus interest. So there, there's words about guaranteeing the bond. You guarantee the bond. Well, legally, we don't guarantee the bond. We're not a guarantor on the bond. We promise, we do a promise pay 
um, that in, for the privilege of operating the network, we provide the towns with funds every year that equal the bond principal plus interest. Because legally, we're not guaranteeing the loan. So we have a, four other towns coming through. Um, I, my expectation, you know, Chesterfield was 2,000 passings last year uh, for vote or for, uh, for the, the cycle, I guess it was earlier this year. This year, we have about 10,000 total passings in play. My expectation next year is we're going to have somewhere between 10 and 20,000 passings in play. Uh, we have a number of towns that we're talking to now. We're probably talking to 30 or 40 towns, and they're all saying, okay, how do we, how do we get in, right? How do we get in? Well, there's a process to follow. You have to do an RFI. You've got to map your town broadband. So this isn't, um, it, it's, it's hard work on the town's part, frankly. Uh, you know, I've seen what Chesterfield's done. I've seen what the other towns that we've worked with have done to this point. It is hard work. Um, there's a lot of activity that has to happen around creating the broadband maps, making sure your RFP is exactly the way you want it, evaluating RFP responses, and, uh, and then the bonding process associated with that. So um, very excited about what we're able to do in New Hampshire. Um, RSA 333G is transformational. Um, we've been talking to states all over the country. It's actually being referred to in a lot of cases as the New Hampshire solution. Um, and people are trying to find a problem with it, and it just keeps working and working and working. So with that, I wanted to transition just a little bit to, um, actually, you know what, take, take that back, back up a second. We have received, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 13 RFI requests um, out of Carroll County from towns saying, hey, give us your broadband information. Um, give you a little peek behind the curtain there. The process that we follow, and pretty much every other provider follows with this, is we need a non-disclosure agreement with that. And, and here's why. Um, we are regulated both by the FCC and by the State Public Utilities Commission. There's something in the industry called CPNI, which is Customer Proprietary Network Information. We are not allowed to disclose customer proprietary network information to third parties. Address level speed qualification is customer proprietary network information. So the process that we typically have followed is we have an NDA that's specifically designed for municipalities and it's specifically designed for handing over broad address level broadband information. Once we're under an NDA, that allows us to give you the information as the towns to say, okay, here's the address level information. You can do with that what you want. What we ask is that you not disclose specific address level information that 84 Main Street in Wolfboro qualifies for 100 meg. Um, what you can do with it is publish it and say 84, uh, 84 Main Street in Wolfboro is served by the federal definition or not served. That's not a CPNI violation for us. So if the minimum standard is 25 by 3, we give you a list that says here's the address, here's the upstream speed, here's the downstream speed. Um, we get in trouble if that gets out. So um, for your uses as a town, as long as you say this location is served at 25 by 3 or not served, everybody's good. So if you have questions about that, if you've gotten our, uh, our non-disclosure and you're nervous about it, let me know. We'll talk you through it. Um, but we've signed probably 30 or 40 non-disclosure agreements with towns um, in New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont so far. Um, it's not a scary document. It just protects us um, from getting in trouble at the state or federal level. So with that, uh, one of the questions that we get a lot is, okay, you did Chesterfield and you did it in uh, you know, a pretty compressed time period. If you have five or six towns, can you do those at once? I've gotten that question from every single broadband committee we've talked to, and the answer is yes. Uh, our capacity to flex up and flex down is pretty incredible. Uh, I couldn't have told you that two years ago. I think we would have had issues with this based on us adding additional resources and getting work flexibility to do things like bring in contract resources when necessary, um, it gives us the ability to do quite a bit in a very compressed time frame. We built Chesterfield all with our own technicians. Um, but as projects get larger, we physically don't have enough people to do that, and we have trusted contract resources we bring in, again, to flex up or flex down. Um, if we get 10,000 passings, through this next vote cycle and bond cycle, that doesn't concern me in the slightest. We can build all of those at the same time. May have to bring in a little bit of contract resource here and there, but the majority even of that, we could build probably with our own internal resources. But I wanted to give you a little bit of a case study. Um, Chatham, New York. So Chatham, New York, if you're not familiar, is just south of Albany. Um, I have the map on there and, and I located Albany so you can kind of get a general look. That red box, that is not 100% of service territory, it kind of spiders all over the place, but you get a feel for the general area. 
If you've been to the area before, it looks an awful lot like this area. It looks an awful lot like Carroll County. Carroll County's elevation is a little bit higher, um, but it's very, uh, lots of trees. There's lots of really big hills all over the place, not as big as these, but still pretty big. Um, lots of granite in the ground, lots of stone in the ground, lots of aerial cable up in the air. Chatham, New York um, is about 660 square miles. And when we started, we had about, five, uh, about 700 miles of fiber. So there was a fair amount of fiber in there already. Um, we had about 38,000 total passings, 20 central offices, and 28% of subscribers were at maximum speed. So if you flip back a couple of pages, compare that to, to Carroll County. Um, Carroll County has more square, uh, more square miles, but if you back out the National Forest, it's pretty darn close. I think it's 990 square miles, something in that neighborhood. Back out uh, the National Forest, and you're probably in the six or 700 square mile area. Um, fiber miles are a little bit more there, but we've got some transit fiber that is, uh, is not too far off the mark. So it's not uh, eliminate that, and it's pretty darn close. 38,000 passings compared to 47,000 passings. Um, the same number, roughly the same number of central offices, and this, uh, roughly the same number of customers at maximum speed. So New York, a couple of years ago, sponsored a program, and this is the way to build broadband, if you have the opportunity. Um, the state of New York won a lawsuit. I don't even know what the lawsuit was about. They got a judgment of half a billion dollars. It's 500 million, and the governor decided to dedicate 100% of that to building broadband in the state. So if you have a spare half a billion dollars laying around, this gets a lot easier. <laughs> So the state sponsored a grant program. It was actually pretty innovative. Um, and, and what we're doing in New Hampshire is really unique and there's a lot of eyes on it. Um, this is a model actually that works really well, but again, you gotta have the funding source ahead of it. What New York did was sponsor a program, an auction process. So they took census blocks, just like the federal government. I'm not a huge fan of the census block level, by the way, but um, uh, it was an auction process where they said, okay, we're gonna put this census block up for auction. Uh, they, they, it was a little more complex. Um, they had three different levels of served versus unserved. 10 by one, 25 by three, and then 100 by 100. The auction process weighted um, anybody that could get faster speeds. So even if it cost a little bit more money, if you were delivering fiber, frankly, um, your, uh, your bid got weighted higher. So the state didn't, and they did this really smart. The state didn't, uh, not every location in the census block was grant eligible. And the grant was an 80-20 match. The state paid 80%, 80 um, the provider paid 20%. As a general rule, some were a little bit off that, but as a general rule, it was 80-20. In our service territory, um, we bid on 10,000 grant passings. Now, I'll describe this a little, and this is why the state was pretty smart. They claim they didn't do it on purpose, but I'm pretty sure they did. Um, one side of Main Street, was grant eligible. The other side of Main Street was not. Because they knew providers were gonna build down the street, you're gonna hit those other houses anyway. Um, so they were able to essentially uh, double, their, double their money. So for the 10,000 grant passings, um, we just completed that. We actually completed that project. End to end was about 16 months, but that includes all of our prep time and all of our finish up time. The actual, from the time we started uh, shovels in the ground to the time we started to turn the first customers up was about eight, eight or nine months. Uh, we passed actually a total of 22,000 passings. So 10,000 grant passings, 12,000 non-grant passings. The total price was about $46 million. Um, 37 million of that was the state, about nine million was ours. We built 1,176 or 78 miles of backbone fiber to put that network in. So if you make the comparisons between Carroll County uh, you know, 47,000 passings, say 40 or 50% of those are seasonal, that gets you around 20,000 passings. Um, fiber miles aren't too far off. So you can do some math pretty quickly and, and understand that this is absolutely doable. We just did it. We just completed a build almost identical to this in New York, um, you know, not less than eight or nine months ago. So again, broadband is what we do. Rural broadband is what we do. Um, so when I look at a Carroll County project, a lot of square miles, it's, I won't say it's not a big deal, but it's absolutely doable. Um, this is one example, I could give you many, many more of, uh, of builds exactly like this that we've completed. So this is a, a space that we know very, very well. So with that, I'm done. I will take any questions you might have. Yes, sir. On the confidentiality. Speak into the microphone, please. On the confidentiality, you said you could give us the information, and if we scrubbed 
it to binary over under on the uh, we could use it. Use why, it. Why don't you just give us the scrub data? Most uh, well, I'll tell you why, and, and we can do that. The answer is we can do that. Um, most towns want a more granular level of detail, so they want to know what areas are we delivering 768k, what areas are we delivering 100 meg. Um, it might alter the economics. If you just want the binary list, we can do that without non-disclosure. If you want that additional level of detail, we would. Great. Thank you. Hmm? So I would, I would hope that I have the worst service of anybody in your nationwide network. No, I have the worst. I, I, I max out at three megabytes per second. <laughs> okay, and, 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 the, and the evidence of other people, in, in, as, as many people are in the room, is that I'm not alone. Um, and the outrageous situation is that I have to pay for two lines because one is impossible. And the problem I'm told is that my wife and I each have a phone and a computer and I have an iPad. Mm -hmm. And all that service, is impo it doesn't work on two lines, let alone one. Um, so paying more is just a rude shock. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been told every year by my tech fellow who's terrific um, that all they need to do is put a little switchy thing on the fiber, which is not, the fiber is not that far from my house. Uh, it runs a, along the perpendicular road. Um, and we would be, we could be upgraded. Um, many years ago, they upgraded us to 10 megabytes per second, and it stopped working altogether. So they said, oh, gee, you got to go back to, to three. Um, so we're here because your service is terrible. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. In some areas, it's terrible. If you, if you qualify, and I'd say this to the entire room, if you're having service issues today, let me know. Give me your information. Send me resident information. I'm happy to run it down. Let's um, talk after this. Sure, absolutely. I would love to do that because I want to know why you don't qualify for 10. It's going to be a know, Frankly, which it still isn't great, but it's, um, it, it has room to, to spare. I'll tell you, though, that that is, that is exactly the representative issue that we're up against. Um, we're spending tens of millions of dollars every year in the state to upgrade service. But it's so large that where do you go? Our, uh, our approach has been, where do you get the most bang for your buck? So for every dollar we spend, how do we improve service for the most customers? This is a rural state, and we're getting to a point where the densities are getting smaller and smaller. That little switchy thing you talked about is $160,000. So when we, it, and it serves three miles. So draw a circle around that little switchy thing um, at $160,000 in the rural environment, you may have 20 homes, 15 homes. It's difficult to make on four ninety nine or forty nine ninety nine a month. That's the hard part. So that's why these types of solutions are the solutions. We're going out and hitting individual neighborhoods. Um, that's great, and I love it. It's great for that neighborhood. It's not great for that neighborhood. The solution has to be more comprehensive. It has to be a townwide, a countywide solution to really make a difference. So you, uh, you said you had taken a 180 on whether you own the infrastructure or whether the town does. Mm -hmm. What happens in 20 years when that technology becomes obsolete? Um, that's a great question, and I think there's a couple of answers to that. It, so from my perspective, you got to think about, okay, what is that next technology? And right now, the near horizon, it's really two things. It's going to be wireless or it's going to be satellite. Um, Given what we know about technology today, and it's going to change, and 20 years is an awful long time, um, wireless is, in my opinion, probably the most viable alternative, but you can't change the laws of physics. Um, frequencies only propagate certain distances, and some frequencies propagate through trees and others don't. So in this environment, you take all the frequencies like millimeter wave, you know, you read the 5G millimeter wave stuff. You know where 5G millimeter wave gets deployed? Downtown New York and downtown Chicago. It is not coming to northern New England. The densities just don't make it. A, five, a 5G millimeter wave radio goes about 1,000 feet. So it's not going to happen. But there are technologies and there are, um, there, there are frequencies that work in this type of environment with lots of mountains, lots of trees. They don't go as fast. So can't change physics. I think um, wireless has the best chance. 
Uh, the second alternative is satellite. And you know, Elon Musk and two or three other companies are putting thousands of satellites up in space. Um, what they're not telling you it is two things. One, they're really not focused in the US. That's not where those are going. They're going to third world countries. They're going to Africa. That's where they're focusing, their, that's where their opportunity is. Because what 50, I think 56% is the last number that I saw of the United States has pretty good speeds. And when you compare that to fiber, you're future-proofing yourself with fiber. Um, so today, we're delivering one gig symmetrical on fiber. We can do 10 gig symmetrical today. The technology exists today. That's gonna continue to grow. Um, so 20 years from now, if 100 gig symmetrical is the typical residential uh, play, the expensive part of the network isn't always the electronics. The expensive part of the network is the one-time build to get the fiber into each and every home. Once that's established, you can do anything you want with it. And my personal predict prediction, if I'm being a futurist, I think you will see wireless technologies that do better. Um, I think you'll see availability of satellite at some point that has low latency. Satellite service today is so latent, latent, latency intensive, it takes so long for the signal to go to the satellite and back down. Things like VPN and VoIP and gaming and VR are just off the table. You can't even begin to think about those. Physics doesn't change there either. The low orbit satellites are going to improve that, um, but it still doesn't beat a fiber. Everything comes back to a wire at some point, whether it's wireless or a satellite connection. Those are coming to base stations. We may serve some of those um, in a couple of locations, uh, but everything comes back to a wire, and that wire is almost always fiber. So I'm John Border. I'm from Eaton, and uh, I'm an engineer, so I work remotely from home, and this connection is critical to me. But I think that the, the reason that we have this, this group here is because collectively we're not happy with the service that we're getting. So uh, Eaton, where I live, is a very small town, and uh, when I started investigating, you know, where is the fiber, I was astounded to find that the fiber line goes right through the center of our town. Mm -hmm. But as far as I can tell, there is only one user in town. One of the camps actually connects to that fiber. We literally have fiber right there. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, uh, um, do you have plans to make those fiber connections available in which case this committee doesn't need to exist, or are you here to talk to us, to uh, um, encourage us to participate in the fundraising of doing that um, raising of uh, the availability of fiber within the town? And so you're waiting for us to help you to make it possible to make those connections? Because the fiber is there. The fiber is there in some cases. Um, so if you, if you see fiber running through and there's only one customer, that doesn't mean there's only one customer. So the average fiber that we put up is a cable about that big. Yep. It's got 144 fiber strands or 288, or you know, we go up from there. Um, it's, it's not only possible, but I would guarantee that that camp is not the only thing running on that fiber. There may be a leg that is running to the camp, but that fiber is transiting internet traffic for um, some of our copper-based facilities. It's transiting long-distance traffic. I mean, there's a lot of things on that fiber. I'm sure it's going elsewhere. It is. But I can tell you I've driven all the roads. And I've looked at where all the cables are. And there's one user in town. There's one user, yeah, one, one, and anybody has capability to do that. We have a product we call, uh, we call Carrier Ethernet Service. So schools, municipalities, the, the larger businesses, even some work from home, um, will do a, a Carrier Ethernet drop. You can get that service today. It's not the same service that we talk about when we talk about large residential bases. That service is what we call GPON. Um, GPON is built for mass deployment, thousands and thousands and thousands of users. It's um, every, with a, a very small couple of exceptions, our 500,000 
fiber connections across the country are all GPON technology. When we do a direct fiber drop, it's carrier ethernet service. It's the same service we do to cell towers. So it's a, it's a different network, even though it's over the same fiber, it's a different network, it's different electronics. Um, so it's not as simple, unfortunately, as, okay, we're just gonna start doing fiber drops. We have to place additional electronics that allow us to dis distribute that to larger numbers of people. And that's really the key. Again, it goes back to the comment I made before. When you look at a, um, even an urban or a rural area, taking that kind of investment, and it's not insignificant. Chesterfield, 2,000 passings, um, you know, $2.1 million. Um, so here's some, here's some averages for you. In the average urban environment, a fiber passing to get to the pole is gonna be about thirteen dollars to $1,500, somewhere in that neighborhood. In what we call a suburban environment or a semi-rural environment where the population density starts to get wider, um, figure between 1700 to 2200 to get to the pole. In the rural environment, start at 5000 and go up from there. In New York, we had some places where the state came to us and said, hey, we want you to serve these 50 houses. It was $53,000 per passing. They're extremely rural. That's the challenge. And so there are places that we can and have done fiber overbuild because it makes sense. We lower our maintenance cost. Um, we can pick up additional subscribers potentially, so the economics are there. But on a broad, widespread basis, there's got to be there, there's got to be another way um, because the business model doesn't support it. So when we look at things like um, in, uh, town bonding, I mean everybody wins there. We have skin in the game. The town has skin in the game. The residents have skin in the game. We can pretty rapidly turn those things around, but it changes the fundamental economic equation. I'll tell you one last thing, and that was when I met with the selectmen in my town and they asked me, where is the fiber? I, I could tell them that it was about 30 feet away from where they were sitting. And yeah. they did not know <laughs> that. Right mm -hmm. It is, yeah. yeah. We know where it all is. Steve yeah. and I have driven the whole county. Outside yeah. the building, yeah. Yeah. Jerry? Yeah, thank you. I, I have two questions, but the first is a follow-up what was just asked. We talk about this issue about how many miles taking Chatham, how many miles of backbone fiber, mm -hmm. but the real question is, um, how well do we get the service areas served? And so going back to Eaton, because we got distributed uh, from uh, in, in our committee, that map that showed where the uh, fiber ran. And so yeah, it's running right up 153, for example, and, and up Snow Village, but if it doesn't go up Horse Lake Hill Road, those people aren't really served. So when we see the, I say that because my kid lives up that way, but if, when you see this issue about the backbone fiber, and the 10,000 uh, passings, did that basically manage to get a network that got everywhere yes. in that area? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know what we're doing in New Hampshire with the towns we're talking to now, it's every place. It's all of them. Okay. Um, it's all in. May I do my follow-up then? Be quick. Yep. Uh, my follow-up is, is, uh, is slightly different, and that is we do know the economic benefit of, of having broadband both for the towns and also for individuals. And we know that uh, you come on 20 prescriber, uh, subscribers at maximum available speed, but there are some that may not subscribe because they simply can't afford it. Mm -hmm. But those are the very people that need that access for their kids to be able to be educated and to be able to apply for jobs and so on. What accommodations do you as a company make to help low-income people to be able to get at least a 25-3 connection if they can't afford it? Yeah, we, pro we, we um, uh, participate in the Federal Lifeline Program. So it allows anybody who essentially qualifies for low, um, uh, low income school lunches. There's two different phases of that program. One is for um, access line for phone service, but the FCC actually just established a program not long ago that allows them to apply the funds to broadband as well. So we have, we have programs for low income as well. The majority of what we see, frankly, is customers don't know it exists. Um, and, and that's a challenge for me. Uh, all the marketing dollars that we spend is trying to educate customers on, hey, this is what you can get. Um, usually the way we see that is customer calls in trouble and they say, hey, my service is terrible. <coughs> well, it's because you've got your iCloud photos are you know, uploading and it kills your speed. And you know, my network's inconsistent. So a lot of the time, uh, a lot of the time we spend on the phone troubleshooting, uh, I'll tell you 10 years ago, um, to a certain extent, Customers, our number one call is slow speeds or inconsistent speeds, without a doubt. And there's a thousand things that can cause that. Um, Ten years ago, the majority of it was cable trouble. Um, today, the, not all of it, but the majority of it is in the home. Um, with all the cloud applications that are out there, 
one of the downsides of DSL technology is upload is slower than download. And if you consume 100% of your upload, it interrupts your download. And it's the laws of physics, we can't change it. Everybody is, uh, has the same type of service. So one of our biggest challenges is identifying what those sources are and putting them at 2 a.m. as an example. Once we troubleshoot with customers and get through, which is probably part of the issue that, uh, that, that Bert's dealing with, um, once we get through those issues and understand what, what's the consumption, um, then we fix a lot of the service-related issues. But um, that, that's the majority. The customers who aren't at max speed, either they don't know it's there, um, or there's a, a predicating factor that, that makes us say, hey, do you know you can upgrade in speed? But you kind of sidestep the question I asked. They asked you're talking all oh. about service issues, and that is, you don't then have a separate uh, rate for somebody who they have to apply for federal funds. You're saying correct. Yes, we do. Yeah, and how much does that assist them? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'll find out for you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's a that's a nationwide program through the FCC. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. Yep. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. So when you, um, when you build a fiber network, and we'll use your Chatham case study, and maybe it's a technical question, but what gets better? What, what improves in your network visibility? What improves in your uh, ability to have less downtime? What gets better? Um, that's a really great question. And I Thank you. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, service I practice that all night in front of the <laughs> What Thank gets you. better? So I'll tell you what gets better. Service quality and service reliability will go up instantly. Um, copper, I love copper. I really do, and I know everybody disparages copper. There's a lot of life in copper, um, especially copper that's properly maintained, but the limitation on copper is distance. We can only go so far and go so fast. With fiber, that frees us a bit. I always tell people, and as an engineer, you're, you'll cringe at this, but copper is a mechanical device. Um, it's susceptible to interference from water and from a nick in a little cable, you know, in a, in a sheath of a cable somewhere, you know, a mile and a half from your house. Um, it's susceptible to, if you don't crimp it exactly the right way with the right tool, with the right connector, um, service degrades. So when we troubleshoot copper, a lot of that is we step by step have to go through every single piece of cable and make sure that it's, it's working properly and that we got good continuity. With fiber, it's on or it's off. It's light. So uh, when it's not working, we know that it's not getting light. So service reliability improves for a couple of reasons. One, you have fewer disturbers that can interrupt the fiber signal. When it is broken, we can fix it very, very quickly. So response times are faster. Um, that's the number one. That's the reason why we love fiber as much as everybody else does. The number of times that we go back to a customer's house on copper versus fiber uh, would blow your mind because copper will, the minute you fix it, it's going to immediately begin to degrade or be susceptible to those outside influences. Fiber does not. Uh, I was at a town meeting the other day and we had a, 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 somebody in the room, 20 or 30 people in the room. One of the guys in the room had our carrier Ethernet service. Um, he was like an architect or something like that. So he had fiber to his house and he recounted the story that um, of all of the windstorms, of all of the power outages, because he's got the equipment wired into his whole home generator. In three years, he had never once lost service and nobody else in the room could say that. So fiber is going to be a much more reliable platform. Can I follow up? Hmm? And I'm not trying to not trying to poke you here. I was kind of looking for uh, an answer that says, you know, that conversation I just had for you a few minutes ago about most of the problems are in the home or most of the problems are here. In a fiber world, we can sit at our network operations center and we can see the problem. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I told you earlier that we were out for 16, you know, 14 hours, 100 hours, 38 hours. In a fiber world, we ring protect the network, so at least the at least the the access network we can't ring protect. But we can ring. that was kind of what I'm, and I'm sure you do that. We do that. Okay, absolutely. But I, I think you know as as we get a little deeper into the sauce here with with folks, that kind of stuff is really, what I would at least for me, I want to know more about because for us it's availability of the network. Right. The network is not really available. It's broadly deployed. It's just not available. Right. And we need to get the availability up. 
we need to get the response time that you guys or whoever is going to get out in their truck down. Yeah. We need to be able to know from the central office or wherever you call your network operations center, if you can diagnose the problem from there. All of that stuff is high value add for both parties. Yeah, it, it really is. And because our friend who's the engineer, who's, yeah, it, it, it doesn't do him any good if uh, you got a lickety split fiber network and it's off for 16 days. Yeah. That's true, yeah. You answered, you answered the question better than I do. We do actually ring protect all of the backbone network. The, the last mile obviously is not you know, susceptible to trees and cuts and all those kinds of things, but every network we build is in a ring format. Um, That's if there's a fiber cut in one spot, it automatically, or it's supposed to automatically reroute the traffic That's back important. the other direction. Um, going out, and, and that um, goes all the way out to the public internet. So your internet connectivity in New Hampshire either goes to Burlington, Vermont, ultimately, or goes to Portland, Maine. And those are all ring protected, so everything's ring protected. From uh, uh, Burlington, Vermont, as an example, we go to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, we go to Albany, New York, and then we uh, go out from there. In terms of network visibility, we actually have fairly good network visibility today. Um, we can see inside the home and see things like signal noise ratios. So we can do a fair amount, this is new technology we just brought that we had in our other markets brought to Northern New England. We, can, we have pretty good visibility inside the home. It, it allows us to diagnose what we need to roll a truck on and what we don't. Um, some things we can fix remotely, reboot routers, that, that kind of thing. With fiber, um, we do have a, a bit more visibility because the electronics on the side of the house um, actually have intelligence in them. So today, between uh, the, the equipment that serves your DSL connection and the end user, the only visibility we have besides the DSLAM itself is the router. Um, fiber gives us another point. So we can test to the point to the side of the house, we can test all the way in to the si inside the home. Um, and where that helps is fiber is more reliable, it's more resilient, um, you're going to get fewer trouble tickets. So if you've got a pool of technicians in a particular community and you see fewer trouble, that means faster response time when there is. Thank you. No, thank you. Carol. <clears throat> Go ahead, Carol. Um, so I'll just add to, add to that a little bit in that with fiber you can actually use a tool to shoot down the line to find out exactly where it's broken. So it's not maybe here or maybe there or the you know, two miles from your house I and mean, you can actually see where that fiber cut is. That's not my question. <coughs> um, so uh, I have a question on the, RF, on the RFIs mm -hmm. and the uh, non-disclosure agreements and that I understood you to say that we can identify those areas that are served and not served by address um, and we can disclose that to anybody who responds to an RFP mm -hmm. at that level. Correct. But not who gets what exactly. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that was clear. And the second is, um, you answered my question on redundancy just now, so I can take that off my list. Um, you, the new television product mm -hmm. is a streaming product, is my understanding. It is. Okay. And is that, did I hear you say that's now available in the DSL markets? It's available everywhere that we serve in Northern New England, yeah. So that's new. Yeah, um, it I is. I think at this meeting, I, so that's good. Actually, I just lied to you. Um, the Prescott, <laughs> the, the Manchester, the Manchester DMA is open. Um, we've got a couple, one in, in South Western Vermont that serves about seven towns. It's out of Albany. Um, and Press Guile are turning up this week, but as of the end of this week, it'll be available everywhere. It's available here now. Right, so, I, so for this group, I just wanted to clarify that that's a streaming product that will include local channels, um, and so um, including those channels like Nesson and Red Sox and Patriot channels. Yes. Uh, right. and, and so it will be available probably by the time this group would move forward with anything in, as just a regular product in it your mix. Correct. Um, and I think... Uh, oh, I just the 300 mi 300,000 miles of fiber mm -hmm. in this region. Um, just to clarify some questions that went back and forth, that fiber wasn't intended to serve residential areas. It's really intended, to, if I'm not mistaken, to serve your DSL boxes, your enterprise customers, and the homeowner who <clears throat> requires a carrier grade Ethernet drop. But that's not the same fiber that you would use necessarily to do a distributed network throughout. 
Um, I, I would say it's intended to do a whole bunch of things. Um, we do have about 100,000 fiber passings today, and you're going to use that fiber in different ways. Um, you know, some of our fiber is carrier fiber, so it's all backbone stuff. We're hauling traffic from major office to major office. And when I say fiber, it's inside the same sheath in a lot of cases. Some of it is um, taking a, a, a DSL data and traffic and hauling it back to offices. Some of it's for carrier ethernet. So it's kind of a you know jack of all trades. It can do about anything. Um, so I'd say three or four years ago, there wasn't a lot of fiber being deployed in Northern New England. So predominantly it's for office to office traffic and it's for like DSL data traffic, enterprise level. We have a lot of enterprise users with direct fiber connections, whether they be businesses or schools or municipalities. Um, but it's perfectly designed to serve fiber to the home. Now, in you know, there would certainly be fiber needed to be built in Carroll County, and what that is going to be for is, um, so when we do fiber to the home, and everybody else does, we put these boxes in called splitter cabinets. Um, a splitter cabinet kind of replaces the concept of the DSLAM, which is what we use today. Um, so imagine a fiber coming from the internet to a splitter cabinet, again, about the size of a dorm fridge, maybe a little bit bigger. You open that up and you'll see 32 or 64 fiber connections in there. That fiber connection goes to an individual user. So big pipe comes to the splitter cabinet, then little pipes go, or relatively little pipes, or smaller fibers go to the end user. Um, those boxes all have to be connected to fiber. One splitter cabinet, as a general rule, will do about 32 aggregate miles of fiber. So there's still a distance limitation in theory uh, with fiber, but we engineer the network for future expansion and future growth. So every time we place a, uh, a splitter cabinet in for fiber, um, there has to be fiber connecting it. So the majority, if we were to do all of Carroll County, um, there's absolutely going to have to be a lot of fiber built, but it's going to be to relocate um, because ultimately, you know, on the DSL network, that would go away. We don't use that at all in a fiber network. So some of that would be reused. A fair percentage of it would be reused. There would also be, have to be a lot more fiber built. Thank you. I, I have, um, I've asked all my questions in previous meetings, but Pat Farley couldn't be here today, and she asked me to ask a question for her, which she asked the GWI folks at our last meeting. And that's aside from the time it would take to go through the bonding and financing and that sort of uh, project. Um, how soon could uh, Consolidated start a build, construction? Do you have the capacity to move uh, quickly? Mm -hmm. And approximately how long would it take to uh, service the entire county? Well, the first question, when could we start? Today's Thursday. Um, <laughs> Done by the weekend? Christmas is coming up. Uh, so we could start fairly quickly. I, and I'll use, I, I gave you the Chatham example on purpose because there, it's, I mean, almost not totally identical, but there's a lot of similarities between the two. Um, the ramp up time for us for the Chatham build was a about 60 days and that was for us to gather the fiber um, get the work crews you know there's going to be a time period where we have to engineer the network too um, end to end engineering for a single town engineering takes us you know call it a week or two this is a bit bigger than that so there's going to be an, an engineering component to it as the very first thing then it's assembling materials then it's starting construction one of the nice things about fiber is that you don't have to wait until it's all done to turn the key on um, and in, in Chatham and in all the builds that we're doing in, in towns in New Hampshire right now, um, we open up each one of those splitter cabinets as it's hot and live and ready for service, we open up that service area. So this is something that you would see construction starts, here, here's what it would look like. And this is the part where uh, we have to really manage and user expectations quite a bit. Chesterfield's a good example. We built 92 miles of fiber in Chesterfield in about six weeks. Um, those crews were screaming. That's, that's a lot of fiber in a hurry. They were working Saturdays, Sundays, um, getting fiber in as fast as they could. <laughs> so everybody sees fiber going up and they're like, when can I order service? Well, following that, we have to splice all that fiber. So the splitter cabinets need to be installed and then every one of those fibers has to be spliced. It's not, I won't say it's not hard. Um, it's hard, with the right tools, it's easier, but it takes a long time. It takes almost as long to splice the network as it does to build the network, the backbone network. Then we have a test and burn in period and then we turn up. Um, I would tell you as a dart throw, set the time required to, engin to engineer aside. Um, I think that the, you know, the Chatham was 16 months, end to end. That was from, okay, go, 
um, here's your funding source, to we are fully and completely done. We did have some periods of time in there where weather, we were weathered out, and that can happen. But in a lot of cases, we can still, you know, splicing can happen when there's snow on the ground, not a big deal. Um, if it's not safe for the technicians to be out running fiber, we're not going to do that. Um, I'd give you that as, as a high level. Um, the real construction to turn up period, so construction to first customer turn up, was nine to 12 months in that neighborhood. So full build would be longer than that. I think Bill had a question here next. Well, mine was a, probably a quick question, but- Speak into um, the microphone. Being a, um, like you said, 50% or so of, of the county is uh, seasonal. Um, we do get more complaints in the summertime when our <laughs> seasonal folks are here. And I'm just wondering, is your backbone capacity uh, uh, designed for full population rather than the summer or the winter population? Yeah, it, it is. I always scratch my head a little bit when I hear that you get more complaints. And so of that 23 states that we serve, I'm a cable company in several of those. And I run a cable operation, a couple of pretty sizable cable operations. Um, and I'm not going to bash my friends in the cable business because I are one. Um, so I would expect to hear that in a cable network. I wouldn't expect to hear that on a fiber or a DSL network that's properly engineered. And the difference is in a cable network, it's a shared environment. Um, there's something called a CMTS that sits inside a cable network. It's capable of 500 total mega throughput. Now, providers oversubscribe because not everybody's going to use all 500 mega at the same time. Um, the same way that you know, voice is oversubscribed as well. But when a cable operation hits that 500 meg limit and they have enough aggregate users using enough aggregate bandwidth to consume that 500 meg, the only alternative they have is to add another piece of equipment. So it's fairly common in the cable space, if you're not ahead of your capacity planning, to run into that situation. Ideally, when we get to 75% utilization, we start looking at, in, in our cable world, we start looking at node splits. So we split the node and we add another piece of equipment. In copper and fiber worlds, it's a one-to-one -one correlation. So the choke point, there's two potential choke points. One potential choke point, and there's a couple more, but the big ones, uh, is the backbone fiber, and then the second is internet capacity. So our backbone network is designed for 10 gig rings um, for the most part, and that's on a single fiber. We actually use something called dense, dense division wave multiplexing, where we can take a single light wave and expand and contract that as necessary to add additional capacity. So capacity is generally not an issue. If we hit the capacity limit on a specific fiber, even with DWDM, we slide another card in, poof, you have more capacity. Um, our upstream capacity and those connection points that we make to the public internet, which are, you know, they're not everywhere. That's why, you know, Portland and Albany go out to larger, uh, yeah, Portland and, and uh, Burlington go out to larger cities. Um, there's only so many places where carriers interconnect. And I say so many places, there are dozens and dozens and dozens in the U.S., um, but they're major metropolitan areas. Um, so where carrier hotels is what they're called. When we buy upstream capacity, we buy big pipes. We're not connecting uh, to the public internet over um, you know, traditional fiber. These are carrier hotels in Boston, Albany, New York, Portland, where everybody is. Um, it's the, the wind streams and the century links and the, uh, the um, level threes of the world um, and AT&T and Verizon. So those connection points aren't fixed. When we buy capacity, we buy flex services. So we have the ability to expand and contract as necessary. Um, those hit limits at times, and that's when we add another pipe. Um, so those are the two limits. It's possible, if we're not on our game from a planning perspective, that we could hit a capacity limit, but nine times out of 10, it's, hey, we add another wavelength, and we're good to go. So we manage that pretty carefully. Chip? Yeah, come up to a microphone somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate the upgrading the service, et cetera, but there are a couple of things that all of us towns struggle with, and one is uh, renting the pole space. The other is the abusive nature of our cable uh, providers. <laughs> so I guess what I would need to ha know is that who, what you said we're going to own the network. You're not going to uh, turn over ownership of your trunk lines to us. And if we own the, the, the lines that are going into the houses, not sure, we're gonna pay for it, obviously, through a bond. I don't see where that ownership has uh, endorsed any benefit 
other than you being able to put the service in. But ultimately, the benefit all uh, flows to you guys. You're going to set the rate. Right. You don't have any input in the rate that you're setting. Right. You're going to determine the speed limit. You're going to have all of the controls. We're going to pay the capital costs for your upgrade and really actually not, not have any benefit other than the service. And if you're working under the same rubric as the cable companies, we're never going to get rid of you. <laughs> so if somebody better comes along, too bad. Yeah. Well, and, so and then I, I, are you paying the poll rent? I'm sorry? Are you going to pay the poll rent? Yeah. Yeah. So are you, de are you, you determining that you're going to pay the poll rent on wires that we own? So let, let me clarify a little bit. What we're doing with towns in, in New Hampshire today, it's, there's a little bit of a distinction. Um, the asset that the town owns is at a DMARC where it's going to be a piece of equipment where we own a piece of it, the town owns a piece of it, and it's where the shared handoff point is. Um, and then we take the traffic from there. Um, that then, the, the network goes up to the pole outside of a customer home. We pay from the pole inside of the customer home. The average cost of that for us is about thirteen to fifteen hundred dollars per drop. So it's it's not that we get a hundred percent of the benefit. I use Chesterfields as the example. Um, Chesterfields is a two point one million dollar network. They're bonding for one eight. We're paying the other three hundred thousand to cover the non bondable homes. We're also paying another just shy of a million dollars for the connections from the pole into the end user home. So it really is shared benefit. At the end of the day, that network is worth about $4 million, and we've, we've equally spent over the top of it. The way we're structuring the deals is that the, so it's essentially, again, two agreements. We'll build the network for you, then we'll operate it. Um, we operate the network for a period of years, and it's a long period of years. It's got to overreach the bond period um, for some IRS rules. We're trying to, we're trying to take advantage of non-taxable dollars. Uh, non-taxable bond dollars because that pool is much larger in New Hampshire than taxable bond dollars and for that the town has to own the asset so that's one of the one of the primary reasons that the town is owning the asset and the deals that we're negotiating right now is so we can take advantage of that larger pool of dollars we then operate the network uh, for the town and that has to have according to to IRS rules in order to take advantage of um, the non-taxable bond pool um, that has to expire so in the, the agreements we're, uh, we're negotiating now, at the end of that period, which again, overreaches the bond period, and you're talking about decades, um, the town then, you own the asset. So you've got three or four choices. Choice number one is, hey, you guys have been doing a good job. Um, we're just gonna extend out. Choice number two is, we're gonna run the network ourselves and kick you out, which I wouldn't advise for a whole lot of reasons. Um, option number three is, we're gonna go bid it again and we'll see who wants to come in. The way the networks are designed is to be portable. And so if another provider at the end of the expiration wanted to come in, they could do that. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess maybe you should share one of your contracts with this group so we can kind of review it. Um, we're gonna have to determine at some point in time how long a bond we wanna take. Mm -hmm. And are we the people that are going to decide that, or is your company going to decide that? So there are a lot of elements to this that I think we Yeah, and, and I'd, I'd probably tell you, too, that, and, and that's fine, we can do that, but I'd probably tell you that there's a lot of work that needs to happen before you're even to that point. Um, I think you need to do that full network assessment. You've got to understand what you have before you can understand what a deal looks like. So what works for a small town in New Hampshire may not work at a county level. So we may need to look at what the structure of that looks like and how we arrange it, how we organize it, because I think that um, I, I would personally think that the cost of a network like this, I think the New Hampshire Bond Bank might blanch at that, and there may have to be other sources, maybe federal sources at that point. When you look at alternate funding sources, the rules may have to change. So I, I hear the concern for sure. Um, I think we can address it, but it's probably premature until we know what we're doing first. Becky? I'm going to play devil's advocate because you were talking about putting your boxes out and they house 36 to 40 drop lines off your mm -hmm. refrigerator boxes. My concern is I've got it running by my house. I'm fairly close to major highways, mm -hmm. but I've got a number of people that live seven miles outside of town. They're the only house. Yes. You're willing to drop to them as well. We are. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to understand what the network looks like, right? What do you have today? 
so we can do a reasonable cost assessment. So in, in my brain, again, just kind of assuming this process follows what's happened with the smaller towns, um, we're going through the RFI process now, where all the towns are assembling their information um, to be able to create that network map. The next phase of that then is for you to provide us with what that looks like. We have to see, because I, I have a pretty good idea where everybody else serves, but I don't know for sure. So the network map that you create is extraordinarily valuable to me because it allows me to then go back and say, okay, I know, I know, I know where everything's at. Now, realistically, we've been in the small towns overbuilding everything, um, but there may be um, an alternative where maybe some areas don't get built because they already reach a one gig capability. I don't know of any place off the top of my head that would see that, a reliable one gig capability. Um, so yeah, we probably would build everything. And in the towns we're looking at, we're building everything. One of the advantages of scale is you minimize those really expensive properties. Again, back to the New York example. We built some places in New York that realistically our cost was 15,000 per home, which is, is really pretty high. They can go higher than that, but realistically 15,000 uh, per home. But when you get a large number of, uh, of passings that are 1,000 per home, it offsets those. So scale really matters when it comes to a build like this. This uh, smaller builds become much, much harder because it's tough to offset those high cost areas. I got a question, Rick. Well, Bert had his hand up first. Um, I, I live right on the main border and that three mile away switch is actually in Maine. Does that present problems for municipal bonding and things like that? Because for your company, you operate everywhere, yeah. not an issue. Yeah, it, it really isn't an issue. Um, there was some discussion last year in the legislative cycle about um, multi-town bonding. Um, I'm not a fan of that, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, the network is a mesh. So the towns that we look at today, we serve them from a number of different places. Our network doesn't respect town boundaries. We don't build a town network. They come from everywhere. So when you would come to a multi-town bond, defining the network, you know, where does it start and stop? To the question earlier, it's, it's almost impossible because um, I could have a piece of equipment in one town that's serving another town. Um, it, it gets really messy. The um, the, the concept of the communication utility district, I think, solves that. Um, and I know there's some legislation around that, doubles in the details, I want to see what that looks like. But the communication utility district allows us to say, okay, this is the boundary, right? And, and we know exactly what that boundary is. We know exactly where everything um, is served to and from. It doesn't matter where it's initially served from. And there's a, there's a distinction between a communication utility district and a multi-town bond. It's not the same thing. So I, I Again, in concept, and you see the detail, but in concept, I think the Communication Utility District solves a lot of that. Okay, we're down to about a minute here. Um, <clears throat> my um, son lives in Linfield, uh, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and um, my daughter lives in Bow, New Hampshire. Oh, okay, and my daughter lives in Bow, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're in that millennium area that know a lot more about these things than I do. Um, and I see both of them, the one that lives in um, Linfield, Mass, because they have Comcast and Verizon, their monthly rates for what they get compared to exactly what I get here is $89. Mm -hmm. And for what you give us for the exact same package is $235 a month. Now there's different packages, but I just know if we identical, which is a pretty extraordinary difference for people that are paying for your services, and sometimes it's not as good as their service down there. So my question is, is, have you, your, is your company looking at, like what my daughter does in Bo now? She has completely eliminated her cable service because of Netflix. Mm -hmm. and again, I don't know half of these things, but they do. She's doing Hula, I think it is. Hulu, Hulu. That, that is now getting, if they like the Red Sox. Mm -hmm. At what point do you, does your company feel like, from an economic standpoint, that there are going to be more and more people, like my daughter in Bo, that doesn't have the competition, and we don't have the competition, but they're getting so fed up with the high prices that we should be getting more down in that $90 range where it makes sense for us to continue doing this mm -hmm. with you, at what point do you feel like your company is going to be affected 
by these other outside competition. Now, I understand why you're at 235, because we have no other place to go. But because of all these new innovations that are coming, are you thinking about that at all, about bringing your costs down? Well, so first and foremost, I really would like to see your bill, because I'm not sure from a residential no, subscriber no, 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 what no, we can no, charge I, to get to 235. I, no, I, it's 235. Okay. Okay? And uh, let me hand a regular cable service in the Wolfboro area. Cable. Cable. Yeah, well, no. You get the phone, you get the cable, and you get the internet. Right. So for, for, uh, for our service, phone cable and internet is going to be about $150 a month. Well, it's not in Wolfboro. Where not, not with Comcast, it's not going to be. It's going to be 235 No, no. Our service in Wolfboro is not 150 That's cable service, though. No, no. I'm talking about internet, phone, and cable. What is it in a typical person that has a typical thing with Ness and everything is paying over $200? Right. You, you, you will with Comcast, with our service. Yeah. Oh, it's not Comcast. Yeah, I'd like to see your it's bill. Atlantic it's Atlantic. Oh, Atlantic. Okay. Let's okay. So why, why is it that they get 150 and we're getting 200 at Atlantic? That's the question. What? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> well, but can you answer that? Since you're, well, can you understand why we're not going to Atlantic and doing something about that? Yeah, this, the, the well, but, but, but we've been doing this for they a while. They can talk afterwards. When, oh, when is that going to hey, happen? You can, they can hey, talk hey, afterwards. We're running low on time. Yeah. No, no. I, I, all I'm getting at is, is that I'm just saying, do you feel like you're going to get start getting pressure? At, we, at, at, we've been getting pressure for 10 years. Um, as a general rule, our, our bills all in. And again, we just launched TV service here for 50 meg service phone service and our, our TV service, which is really similar to what you're going to see with Hulu, you're going to pay about 150 bucks a month and then whatever taxes are on top of that. Right. So, yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen that That makes pressure, more sense to doubt. be 150, but 235 yes. is extraordinary, I think, compared. Okay, so this is, an, this is an issue. I didn't know that. Yeah. What? He's offering competition. You bet. But are we... Competition is going to drive prices. Okay, yeah. can we're, I, can we're I, just can about out of time. But can I still ask an issue, no? How quick is it? It's a yes or no. It should be a yes yeah, or no. We've got one minute. Yes, well, that's fine. Um, quick question. It has to do with exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. When GWI made their presentation, they talked about open access, where the dark, dark fiber would be available for others to be, for other competitors to come in, so you could have the specter of competition. The question that came up over here was that question about you um, still being the ISP when you run this, mm -hmm. and we don't have competition, and we don't have any control over the fee. Would you make your dark fiber available for competitors so that we could have true competition for the ISP? Um, that would be an alternative once we looked at the business case. We'd have to see what the business case looked like. I, I, would, I would caution you that open access isn't always open access. Um, and I would look at other networks that said they're open access networks and see how many other competitors they have in them. OK. okay. Rob, thank you for yes. coming. Thank you for your time. To us. Thank you. It's been very informative. Um, and if, if anybody has any future questions from this meeting, um, I don't know if Rob wants to hear from all of us, but if you send them to uh, Steve or I, we could, we could make those questions available to Rob and get answers back to you in writing so we can hold them to him. <laughs> so, however, if you have personal home issues with your CCI service, he's going to be handing out business cards. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> that was a very nice. It's <laughs> 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 oh, Okay, you got their attention. <laughs> okay, um, let's move on with the rest of our meeting uh, so we can be done on, on time. Um, again, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Paul O'Brien and the town of uh, Wolfboro for hosting us. Um, first up here, I'd like to get a, a motion and approval for our minutes from November 14th, which we had in Boltonboro. We have a second over there. Is there any discussion, errors, or omissions? Hearing none, I'd call it to a vote. All in favor of the approval of the November 14th minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed? You guys have it. Um, as far as grant updates at this point uh, for the feasibility study and the financial plan and whatnot, 
Um, I have received the parcel counts from all the towns except for Jackson and Bartlett, and we are currently working on with the new rep from uh, those two towns currently. Um, we have a couple of towns that we haven't heard from for the municipal buildings that, that need to be served, um, primarily Bartlett <clears throat> and Jackson, and I think um, the other is Conway, but I'm working with Tom Holmes on that to, to get that inventory for Carroll. Um, as far as the RFIs, I believe everybody is either in the process or have them sent out. Um, we are starting to get back the mutual non-disclosure agreements that uh, Rob just spoke with us about. Um, I have spoken to him privately as well as his information here, and I feel comfortable now signing these uh, mutual non-disclosure agreements. I think he explained it well. Um, and, you know, if you read through the legal jargon in there, I think we're in, we're in okay shape. Um, and until we hear more from uh, the people that are doing the feasibility study, um, we can take a little time off for the holidays. <laughs> Ms. Becky? I'm getting there. You're just, you're jumping ahead, okay? <laughs> I have finally, okay, had a 30-minute conversation with John Mayer from Spectrum uh, Charter. Um, very dry personality. Um, <laughs> must be a lawyer. Um, they are interested, and they are now, I guess, discussing at the corporate level how they want to react and I've left the ball in their court. He said he was going to get back to me um, and have a meeting with Steve and I, and if it's fruitful, um, I would think sometime in January or February we'll have another meeting um, and have them in here to take the wrath of this committee. <laughs> huh? Becky. Oh. Not yet. The mic, please. Not, they have, uh, the question was, have they responded? No, they have not. Okay. Um, they have 60 days. <laughs> we'll fix that. And we're, and we're working on legislation currently. <laughs> we we need that. that, though, right? I mean, without, without their data, we can't build that coverage map. We can't you go forward it. with an RFP. Why not? It's, we're working on it. It's 28 seven. I'm a rebel. I, I think if, if they don't respond, you can assume there's no service. Is a way to look at it. Now. Yeah. Not yet. I mean, if they're willing to give days. up their market share, okay, by not responding, I have no sympathy. Right. Can I speak to that? So, so I think it's something to think about. The, the folks we just heard from are the old New England Telephone Company. They had a responsibility to provide telephone service to every home. In, uh, in the county, for that matter, in the state, for that matter, in the United States. So if we're comfortable, it seems to me, if we're comfortable with you know, agreeing to their NDA, yep. and we know, we know then exactly it, where, where the wires will need to go. Now, the question is gonna be whether the cable company wants to put those wires in, whether they wanna put the wires in, or whomever. We, I, the consolidated people will give us better insight in terms of where the where the homes past are whatever their whatever their nomenclature is and so if we don't hear from the cable company i suppose we could pursue whatever I, I, I letter writing and yelling correct. and screaming that we need to do but I, I i'd opt to go with these characters and make sure that they tell us clearly where this stuff is and then that made that might help us a heck of a lot more than uh, getting data from the cable company that that's just my view from the cheap seats. You know? and, and also, I think the, the folks at CTC and, and uh, Rural Strategies and ValleyNet uh, can sort that out yeah. And, yeah. and come up. That's what they're getting paid the big bucks exactly. for. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true, Carol. <laughs> um, in addition to that, um, Steve and I have been contacted again by Matrix DG. Um, They've rethought this, and they want to talk to us again. Um, so Steve and I are going to meet with them to see if our, 
they're, the media, you know, what they're going to propose is any better from the last time. They basically last time wanted to cherry pick communities and, and whatnot. Um, I'm not sure they're capitalized big enough to do a whole county, but I, I want to give everybody a chance. I don't want anybody coming back after the fact and say, well, geez, right. you discriminated against, right. discriminated against us and, and whatnot. So we're going to listen to them. Um, we're trying to build a partnership here. Um, and I don't want to create enemies at this point. Uh, we'll be nice until it's time not to be nice. Um, as I said, I have been in physical uh, phone contact with someone from Spectrum Charter, and we'll keep you all posted uh, with regards to that. Um, I'll keep you posted as far as email is concerned, what happens when we meet with them. And I would think the next meeting that we'd have would be sometime in the middle or late January. Um, that's all that's been happening as far as that's concerned. Um, I've gone over the progress for what we've had to supply to date. Legislatively, we have um, uh, a couple of bills that we're working on with, uh, with uh, Senator Bradley um, and Representative Jerry Knirk. And Jerry said he would speak to these yeah. right now and let you know where we're at. Just basically, again, the, the, there's a couple that I've been involved with, particularly in the uh, 2871 is the one which does set that penalty if they don't respond that you assume it doesn't have it. The other piece of it, uh, Rick uh, commented about that on this, but there's another second piece, and that is getting access to the E911 system data, again, only to know whether it is a business residence or an empty lot, no personal data. So both of those are done in this RSA. Uh, that has been um, uh, filed, again, thanks to uh, Jeb, since it was after our house filing uh, period, and that's in. The other one, which I've signed on to by Senator Deitch, is the one that does establishing the communications districts. That's uh, LSR 2811. The bill numbers are not available on these yet, so I don't have those. In any case, it's modeled after things like water sewer districts. And what it sets out initially is um, that it talks about, it has a whole new chapter about communication districts, giving the definitions, uh, giving how it's formed. Again, it's modeled after what we already have for other districts, the process of forming, how the towns vote, how they vote to join, how they vote to leave. Um, all that kind of stuff. And then it goes into the details about what the powers are of that corporate body in terms of establishing a budget and a governing board, their operations, establishing private-public partnerships, um, incurring debt and bonds, and all that kind of information. So it's a relatively long LSR, but it has all that in there, and uh, that's, that's, uh, it's, it will be going forth as well. Again, the other ones which I have not, I don't have any information on, is the space on poles and uh, the payment in lieu of taxes. I don't have any information on that, nor on the um, I do want to talk with Jeb after the meeting on those two bills. Yeah. So, and Jeb, uh, would you like to say anything? Sure. If I can um, just hand out copies of the legislation, I think there should be enough there for everybody. Um, this is a pretty discreet piece of legislation. It deals with the E911 and the penalty. So obviously, you know, this is what you asked Jerry and me to file. Um, I think we're going to have a good collection of co-sponsors. And um, again, as I said, in Moldenboro, it's important to reach out throughout the state. Um, I was actually pretty encouraged to hear Consolidated talk about the other big piece of legislation, the communication districts, that it makes their life easier. Um, these pieces of legislation on municipal bonding and other things that have passed over the last couple of years allowing towns to aggregate um, have been difficult. So um, I'd like to think that you know, there's maybe a consensus on how we go forward with this legislation and partnership as opposed to um, working across purposes. But in any case, I think, you know, Jerry and I will be happy to work with you and Carol if there need to be any changes, amendments to this. That's why I passed it out. Um, the a hearing will probably be at some point in January. Um, it could be in February. And um, it'll be important to have our ducks in order. I think any similar groups, and 
this is a statewide problem. Obviously, it's not just a Carroll County problem, but any similar groups around the state that can, you know, provide testimony both on my bill and Khan's bill and Deach's bill, I think is pretty important and a broad coalition. Yes, we're, um, is we're vital. in communications with everybody Perfect. on the other side of the mountains. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And I want to see you after the meeting of all okay. other two. Yep. Oh, yeah. Microphone. When we get the dates in those public hearings, I think it's important that we get back to our boards of selectmen and ask them at a minimum to write a letter of support for these bills. Uh, and if anybody can attend public hearings, I think that's worthwhile as well. We have to demonstrate that there is broad support for these bills. Right. Yes, I think we'll have much more support in numbers and we'll make a bigger impression as well. Also, just uh, when I when Jeb contacted me to come up with three reps to put on it, um, I did try to reach out geographically. Got somebody from Grafton County to be a sponsor, and somebody from a rural part of Hillsborough County to be sponsors because they should have some knowledge of these issues. We've also made contact through um, uh, the organization in Coas County to solicit some support up there as well, and we're working on that currently. Yeah, Steve and I have not been. <laughs> that's been, that's for sure. You have not been that way for years. <laughs> it's almost a full-time job. It is. Is there any other business or any other questions that anybody has? Oh, I don't know if I should give this to you. <laughs> uh, what has been kind of, I guess maybe we took it for granted, but I want to state that with, with Sean Doucette, now representing Jackson and Bartlett, sitting at the table here, all 19 municipalities in Carroll County have a representative and a part of this project. That's awesome. Doing something new and different. <laughs> Is there anything else anybody has? Like I said, if we have any questions for the consolidated folks, please uh, let Steve or I know and we'll make sure that we get some answers for you. They've been very good about uh, communicating. And I, good job. It's, uh, it's, it's a positive thing. Um, I don't have any reason to call a meeting yet in January. Uh, as I just said, we're still working on a couple of others. Um, and as soon as we're done with them and find out, I don't want to waste anybody's time, um, we'll let you know. And we still uh, look for uh, a town that would like to, um, you know, host a future meeting. Uh, okay. Super job. Will you send out the links um, for each meeting as to how we can access the videos so that we can see them? As soon as I get them, uh, I just sent out the most recent okay. one that Timothy up there um, did for us. And boy, he did an incredible job putting that together. I mean, Jeb and I were speaking about the fact that as we get back into session, I'm not going to make any of these meetings for months. And We, we, uh, we understand, and that's why we try to give a good Thank synopsis you. of the meeting and the minutes. Um, and with all that said, motion to adjourn. Huh? Motion to adjourn. No, you can't do that yet. <laughs> <laughs> He's still talking. <laughs> I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Absolutely. Thank and we will we will keep you posted as to you know what develops here over the next uh, three or four weeks. Okay. Thank you very much. Second. Okay. We have a motion to adjourn and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Rick.